Hey, what's up, good people? Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse. <clears throat> it feels like I haven't been here for a long time. Although it's really only been a week, I've been on the road traveling through Colorado on a fun family vacation, seeing all the sights. And yeah, it's kind of surreal to be back in my own home after such an expansive journey. But I'm excited to be kicking off my first day back with a return visit of an old friend and excellent guest, Emily Ridout. Emily has been on, I think, three times already, uh, and we've discussed everything from her work teaching astro yoga, uh, her expertise in folklore, which I find fascinating. And we even did a really interesting one on psychic vampirism, energy vampirism, which I think of anybody I could have talked to about that, Emily brought an excellent positive spin and uh, a real deep knowledge, both on the folklore side and on the personal energy practices side, how we can address this very common survival technique of uh, psychic vampirism. So go back to the archives, check out on the interversepodcast.com website, the search bar. You can just type in Emily Ridout and catch any of the previous conversations we've had. And today we're going to be going with the flow, a free form conversation, which is always a lot of fun. So not sure exactly where we're going to end up. But there's been major shakeups on the sky clock side of things lately, <laughs> as I'm sure Emily can give us some insight on as we get into this conversation. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Oh, you know what? I do need a little bit more maintenance speaking. Uh, you can catch the second hour of the show on Rockfin, of course, R-O-K-F-I-N dot com slash interverse, also on Patreon.com. Uh, forward slash interverse. Both of those are the ways that you get our two of these conversations. And as usual, this one will be, I'm sure, much more bubbly and esoteric by part two once we've warmed things up and all the interesting tidbits of the first hour's connection start weaving together to get an even more epic tapestry of conversation going. So make sure that you're uh, supporting the show if you like what I do here and you want to get more of it. Also, Emily, uh, since the intro's already gone a little long, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and tell them about your websites and how you can connect on social media and all that? Sure thing. So my name's Emily. I'm an astro yoga specialist. And what that means is I help people use their astrology chart with their energy body, physical body connection to figure out how to navigate this crazy world using the sky clock. So um, people can access their sky map and I help them learn to read and use it. So that's what I do. And people can connect with me on Instagram. I'm at Emily Ridout Astro Yoga. You can connect with me online, emilyridout.com. Um, I'm on Facebook too somewhere. And yeah, I'm around. Yeah, you've even hopped in our Telegram group, which is super fun. I'm really enjoying that. So shout out to everybody on Telegram. And uh, let's see, where should we even begin? I mean, first of all, I do encourage people if they use the uh, Instagram, <laughs> nasty Instagram app, go there and subscribe to Emily's page for positive stuff on there that will be also fascinating. I always just get impressed with all the funky poses that you've got going on for different times of year. Uh, we've probably got a large amount of new people in the audience since we last talked. So it would be cool if you gave everyone the rundown on what Astro Yoga is, why it's a useful system that you teach, and how it's sort of customized to the individual. Totally. So a lot of people don't realize that Astro Yoga is a traditional form of yoga. So yoga and astrology have been linked for thousands of years. Um, astrology and medicine and the, the human body have been linked for thousands of years. And so you can use it in a couple ways. So astrology, first and foremost, is a map that helps you navigate things more skillfully. Um, you can also, you know, downward spiral and go into the abyss of the less skillful life, right? But hopefully when you engage with astrology, you begin to use those energies to your benefit and to the benefit of others. And so you can start to access and wake up those things through the body. You can also do it through other activities you might choose to do. But I help people figure out like exactly what 
energetic practice will suit you if you want, you know, growth in exactly this area, or if you just generally want to feel better, or if you are recovering from um, a huge shock, like many people have been and will continue to be for the next couple of years, right? So there's a lot there's a lot there. And so you can access it either just by like doing yoga for the timing of the stars, which is what public classes are that I teach, or you can get really into your own birth chart and say like, how am I going to handle, you know, Uranus and Taurus the best way possible? How can I, you know, actually wake up my North node and go toward my true Dharmic purpose instead of spinning around in some culturally or familially prescribed, you know, lifestyle that might not be of your true choosing. And we've talked about that North node, South node thing in previous conversations, and you helped me grasp that as a concept. And man, it's a, it's super real for me personally. Like everything in my South node is easy and I'm drawn to just sort of like defaulting there. And then the North node, the more I push towards it, which is difficult, the better things work out for me. And then what's interesting too, is like the South node stuff remains a part of my life. Even if I don't focus on it, I don't need to. So it's, um, I think what you teach is really cool because people can move in different ways to think in different ways. We have all these correspondences between the Zodiac and the parts of the body. And then with yoga, different movements are you know, everything in the body from one fingertip all the way to another toe is connected. And we can think differently by stimulating our organs through specific motions. And I also believe you would probably anchor in a better knowledge of your own personal chart and your own human design by learning movements that are keyed into your strengths and weaknesses. Because for some people, astrology is just very like left brained and it really kind of has become super left brained with modern technology giving us the ability to get very complex with the uh what we're able to determine about our chart you know in the past you would have had to have probably had ancient books and scrolls and astrolabes and all kinds of devices to get a chart to the degree that now you can just pop in your information on a website and have it cranked back out to you so rooting it in something body oriented, which is more right brained generally, we probably can learn and remember, and even that word remember, reattach parts of ourself that uh, more easily than just trying to take it all in as words on a screen or pages in a book. It's true. And also, you know, sometimes things can be scary in your chart. So for example, everybody's North Node represents a space that their soul longs to go, but that they might not yet be comfortable with. So a lot of the work in this life is integrating that North Node point, as you pointed out. So, so when you're doing that, um, let's say someone has their North Node in the ninth house and they have this deep desire to travel right? Or to go to university or study something or um, get really deep into a mystery tradition or whatever it is. And so they're, they're sitting there and they're like, okay, I really want to do this. Um, sometimes the full jump in is the right prescription, but sometimes it's a little too much for us to handle. Like if you've never, ever left your hometown and then one day you decide to move to a foreign country, that's gonna be a big shock. So it might very well be that your soul wants to do that, but you can start to get that energy aligned and attuned in your body so that the jump into your purposeful dharmic path is actually feeling good and aligned, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally does. I'm I find it fascinating just what flexibility can do for an individual. I've been studying more Wilhelm Reich again lately. I mean, he's there's so many amazing individuals from the past to read that I can never actually get through everything one person has done, but I like will return to different ones as uh, I feel like maybe I'm ready to take on another aspect of their work. And I've been learning a lot about Reich's concept of armoring 
and how we armor ourselves character lo- character logically like our personality becomes rigid in some aspects but it coincides with rigidity in the musculature system and that rigidity is actually stuck energy when you just break it down to the basics of what it means anything that your muscle muscles are doing to stay in a certain position requires a type of focus mentally even if it's below the surface of consciousness that is keeping you in that state like the guy that always has to have his chest puffed out and feeling solid right there. And it's always like a defense mechanism and it dulls or sometimes nearly blocks the feeling of being connected to the world. If you will, that armoring is like a a layer or a filter between sensation of physical consensus reality and your inner, inner energetic feelings, if you will. So getting the, armoring down stretching and flexibility is a big part of that because you're just going to have to you're just going to have to let some stuff go if you're going to get into certain positions and it doesn't happen necessarily overnight because with that with that rigidity that we hold on to it can sometimes be a lifetime like i said it's character armoring and that is somewhat influenced by the character that you have uh, chosen for this life based on your sky clock configuration but also there's sort of false character armoring that is imposed upon us from the outside uh, belief about who we're supposed to be according to the eyes of the world or according to the eyes of parents or, or whatnot. So the best thing we can do for ourselves is to become more supple and soft, even though that sounds counterintuitive, especially to like the masculine intention of being tough and strong, but in terms of survival and and the deep truest aspect of strength what is soft and supple and flexible becomes much harder to break than something rigid and tense and when we let go of that inner rigidity wherever it's hanging out in our body it it actually opens up mental energy as well because like i said you're holding on to that position you're you're projecting that armor into that spot of your field at all times even if you don't realize it so it wears us out. We don't kind of like after a massage, once some certain muscle tension is loosened, that area will feel like, dang, I've, it feels like I just worked out or something. Uh, even though you weren't doing anything yourself, someone was working on you. That's all my way of trying to explain that like this, the system has massive benefits in a mind body connection level and even mental energy, mercurial thought energy can flow more quickly if it's not being that random access memory of your internal system isn't directed towards holding on to something, keeping yourself in a certain shape. It's true. And you, you quickly find with these practices that they, something you do in yourself in your body and your breath actually brings you something in manifest reality. That's a different new situation to you. And that's highly beneficial. You also find um, people, people who are more rigid, like you were just referencing, tend to release and become more flexible. People who are flexible to the point of having no structure and no boundaries find themselves gaining strength. And so what often happens is whatever the individual needs, these practices bring in. I mean, you want to work with a good yoga practitioner, you want to be doing the appropriate practices for your chart and for the seasons. Um, but I always tell my, my teacher training students, like once you really integrate the knowledge of what these teachings are, you'll be able to look at a person's body. You might not have seen their chart, but you might intuit many of their placements and whether they are overactive, underactive, or ignored in that person and you can figure out how to help them just based on looking at, you know, how are they standing, you know, or how are they moving through space? So in terms of sky clock situations, uh, maybe we ought to talk a little bit about the full moon eclipse scenario that just went down because even though that's already peaked in a sense of what we can see in the sky, as I understand it, when there's this type of a conjunction, if you will, of a supermoon and an eclipse, and I believe it even 
entered into Sagittarius right about the time that uh, the full moon was beginning. Could be wrong about all that, but as I've heard it explained by other astrologer friends of mine, we're going to be writing out some of the transformative aspects of this for several months. Is that correct? Yes. So, so just for people who might listen who aren't super aware of what eclipses are, right? The lunar eclipses happen always at the full moon. Solar eclipses always happen at new moon times. And eclipse season happens once every six months when the sun is within about 18 degrees of the lunar north node or south node. So last eclipse season was around the time of Sagittarius, um, when the sun was in Sagittarius-ish, you know, and now we're over there in Gemini and the lunar nodes right now are in Gemini and Sagittarius. Um, so, So we just had a lunar eclipse, right, which will continue to reverberate for the next six months. And in some people, because I, because big changes do happen in eclipses. So I don't want to say six months exactly for everyone, because some people experience changes that alter the trajectory of their lives. So take it with a grain of salt, but the, the energetic wave continues for about six months, astrologically speaking. And then we'll have a solar eclipse coming up um, also, so we had the the Sagittarius Gemini eclipse moments, and we're we're in the midst of their season right now. And I'm sure when this comes out, we'll still be in the midst of their season. And it's, um, I think it can be really challenging for people because we, I mean, we're both in the United States, right? And we have sort of a cultural idea of independence of the individual, right? There's sort of like, I once, I once, um, I lived in India for a brief time. And when I moved there, they gave me two papers to read. And one was a paper they gave to Americans going to India, explaining cultural norms. And one was a paper for people from India coming to America, explaining cultural norms. And I always remember on the one for people coming to America, it said the hallmark of American culture is the belief that they have none. (laughs) And, um, and I always thought that was really interesting because it was really highlighting things that if I was self-reflective and honest, I did have an assumption about, right. Which was, um, you know, somewhat of an independent nature, not totally. Um, But eclipses come in and they remind us like, you are yourself. Yeah. You're, you're in charge of your energy. You're in charge of your world to a degree, but you're also in a collective and things will come and go. Um, and you get to experience them and allow them to happen. So that allowing comes in that you were just talking about, or that surrender state, Um, But eclipses can be very difficult because no matter how much inner work you've done on yourself, right, or how good you feel in your relationships with those around you, surprises can come in, the unexpected can come in, and the unexpected can leave. So, um, so we get that, that opportunity to, to be like, oh, I was... I was good with myself when I like got used to sort of the status quo of whatever I was in, even if it's a very abnormal status quo, like we're in right now, right? It's sort of a, our new status quo. I don't want to say the new normal, but the, the status quo that we've adopted in a global sphere almost appears to be uh, dystopian as, as you've noted, um, already, I'm sure, and l- literally everyone knows. But no, everything's fine right now. <laughs> this <yeah>. is great. <laughs> but we figure out how to be fine, even when we're like, "Oh, I live in a dystopian episode of, you know, the Twilight Zone." Okay, it feels like a bad <laughs> sci-fi plot lately, for sure. It it certainly does, and um, you know, with the with the eclipse season. Like individuals are going to have experiences. Your individual experience is yours, right? Like someone could enter your life, someone could go, um, something, some job, some whatever, right? 
things come and go during eclipses, but, and they can feel elating or they can feel detrimental, right? And so your emotional experience and your personal experience, not to, not to negate that, but collectively what we're doing is we are reckoning on sort of a global sphere, the South node and the North node as they sit right now, which is smack in the middle of Gemini and Sagittarius, um, which this is sort of my, this is my soapbox lately. Whenever I talk to the astrology students too, is I love thinking about this because, well, you've noticed out in the internet land, at least, or even out in your community, there might be um, different opinions, right? And you might see people splitting their opinions into groups. And most of the time, the groups aren't even real. You're like, these people want this, these people want this. And then there's a lot of projection about what the other group is like, right? No matter what. Um, that's the Gemini North node is when we are looking at all these different opinions and suddenly perhaps shocked that people you've been very close with don't understand your position on X, Y, or Z, right? And then the Sagittarius South node, so Sagittarius always looks for the ultimate truth, but knows that the ultimate truth is very esoteric and rarely gets experienced in human form, though certainly can be, right? And so what happens with the lunar nodes as they are right now is we mistake the, our truth, our individual sort of relative, you know, not like us and our high selves, but just like walking around um, having our inner judgments of the world and others, um, we mistake that for the ultimate truth. And so like the, these eclipse seasons, what I would ask everyone is, can you problematize your truth, no matter how closely you align with it or how right you think it is? Like, is there, is there more? And sort of like, what is the X factor here? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it actually ties into the Wilhelm Reich thing again, because that was what I was reading on the, the drive, a book called, uh, let's see, Ether, God and Devil by Reich. And man, it is just full of total whammies and massive gems. And one of the things he gets into is just the, like, he stands firm in the the knowing that every, not everything he thinks that he knows or is right about is correct. And the people that he sees as incorrect are not completely incorrect. So I, I love that about him because he's, he's so outside the paradigm in terms of the way his thought processes work that it's practically like an alien visiting human society and just asking the most simple questions about like, well, why is this this way? And uh, at the same time, he makes it very clear that even the most outrageous mythological beliefs or religious uh, dogmas, if you will, or just plain incorrect or maybe harmful is a better word, uh, perspectives that people can have about themselves or about life, it's all still always going to be rooted in something in reality somewhere. Even if it's gotten way off base, it's way distorted through the filter, through the lens that they're seeing it, nothing gets it, nothing is expressed through us or by us that doesn't have some rooting or grounding in reality. So that's helpful for me because I've been really studying the difference between like artificiality and reality with the capital R and trying to parse that out. And it's becoming more clear to me that. I, I need to address the issue that even that which is artificial or inverted against nature, sort of um, necrophilous, if you will, death focused, uh, plain harmful, dissonant, still came out of nature because nothing could possibly exist that didn't come out of nature. So that's what I'm reconciling with right now and uh, was kind of seeing my my perspective on it as the grand ultimate truth, but it caused me friction. And it's helpful to be able to take a step back from that and get even more into nuance here and not be 
dogmatic even myself about stuff that seems very right on and very helpful or practical because even the even people that are behaving right now out in the external world in ways that is bewildering to me generally what they're rooted in is some sort of belief that this has this is necessary for capital r reality if you will and i i don't think i mean maybe this is a maybe this is a projection but i don't think there are really that many flat out fully evil people out there it, there's just people that are very confused right now and this is definitely a confusing time so i'm trying to find the compassion trying not to spread doom and gloom ideas to the wrong people <laughs> or or whatever that aren't going to understand it properly but it's difficult for me because i have this thing where if somebody starts talking about something that i know is pretty much completely bogus i'll just be like well you know this is why that's bogus and they might be like a 13 year old and just be like, I thought I was just trying to tell you something cool. <laughs> and I feel like I've just crushed them a little bit. So I'm working on the balance there myself. Not that we shouldn't be rooted in what we see as correct and true, but that we also got to give other people not just leeway for the way they're seeing it right now, but also a little slack, a little rope that they can pull themselves towards that we can pull ourselves towards each other with instead of just being like, just drown then. It's true, like the hallmark of this. So Gemini, right, is the sign of Cain and Abel or Castor and Pollux, right? Castor, like cleanliness and pollution, right? You have this, this split and we tend to see ourselves as perhaps innocent and the other as, you know, wrong. Or when we're in a different state, sometimes we see ourselves as guilty and the other as pure, right? Just depending on what state a person's in. And it's just never... It's just never that we, we choose where we are on some level, even if, even if the choosing is unconscious and some people, you know, they've, they've in some ways subscribed to whatever, whatever reality they're living in. And, you know, the deeper you go along these paths, the more problematized consensus reality becomes because you start to realize the consensus isn't always accurate. Right. And then you, go watch the matrix and you feel better, right. Or whatever you do, but, but there's a, there's sort of like a waking up to that. And, and it's good to recognize things like that. I've done it a few times too, where I'm like, mm, your opinion is really intense in the opposite direction of mine. So maybe I'll tell you a few things that I've read, you know, and, um, and it's so tempting to do that. And, um, and yet it's like, it's like every person is operating according to a worldview that they abide within. And it's, it's, it can be very difficult to shake someone else's worldview. And, and sometimes it's good. And sometimes it's, you know, not, not helpful for that individual in that moment, because maybe they're just trying to, you know, take care of their aging relative or, <laughs> you know, go to the grocery store. Yeah, with the uh, the Gemini, Castor and Pollux, cleanliness and pollution, natural and artificial, all these divides, good and evil. What? So you mentioned things in the this particular clip season, maybe unexpected things happening as part of it. And for me, that was definitely the case. I got to see that on both the uh, fun and the not so fun side all at once, which was interesting. But on the fun side, what I will talk about is that. While I was in Colorado on this trip, there's a venue called Red Rocks in the Denver area. And one of my favorite bands was playing there and I didn't know it. I just looked up, I wonder who's playing here. And I was able to go spontaneously. And that was on the night of the full moon. So that was like a wild peak experience that I wasn't expecting and was really awesome and gave me a little bit of faith in humanity. <laughs> there's a also gave me some annoyance. Like there was literally a, a poison dart vendor at the uh, offering free poison darts and you get a, that's my code word for oh. YouTube. If that makes sense, gotcha. <laughs> offering free poison darts at a, at a concert and you get a t-shirt. And anyway, that was like bothering me at first, but then I just, and it was making difficult for me to not keep my eye on, you know, where that was at. And like, anybody actually doing this here at a concert like what is going on but 
I, I didn't see anyone actually go for it. So that was kind of cool. Like I, I tried not to be mad that it was there. I, I just tried to like enjoy myself, but I kept looking behind my shoulder. Like, is anybody actually doing that? And nobody was doing it. So that was cool. But that was like a, a Gemini moment, if you will, even in the microcosm of going to that concert is that the thing that I would love to forget about existing at all was still right there. Only a few feet away from me. Well, I'm trying to focus on the positive on the peak experience. And anyway, uh, I was happy to see that people weren't, weren't falling for it. The peer pressure side of it. I mean, in my opinion, probably anyone that was going to do it at this point already did. And I think it's bizarre how hard it's being pushed uh, on people that aren't willing at this point. I think the only ones that would now do it that haven't would be like, well, my job is asking me to, or all my friends are making me feel bad for not. So I don't think anyone in this audience needs encouragement to just leave well enough alone and focus on holistic health instead of external promises of uh, big pharma. But the point is that like, even in the peak experience on that full moon night, the, the other side was like constantly trying to get my attention. Like, Hey, 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 here's why everything sucks. But over here on the stage is why everything's awesome. It was kind of interesting. Totally. And you know, that moon was squared by Gemini and Pisces and there, there's something there's something there that is a really key thing. And I think it's, I, I mean, I, I hesitate, you know, as an astrologer to, to push people too far into my worldview, but, but there is, there is something to that where in the Gemini sphere, we're like, okay, I have this opinion about, I liked your word, the poison dart and other people have this opinion and the other side seems loud abrasive, perhaps, um, encroaching in some ways, um, people have feelings of being, um, coerced, bullied, um, probably in both directions, really, if we think about the full swath of everyone on earth, right. People, people are feeling like, oh, is my choice, um, is my choice allowed to be mine? Right. Or, or it, does it now get to be weighed in by, you know, literally everyone around you? Um, but, but this this aspect to Pisces, which is a difficult aspect, um, brings us to the realization that no, nothing is actually separate on some level of reality. And these these problems, these differences that we perceive, um, which are real on some level, also cannot be solved at the level at which we meet them. So if if you're like, gosh everyone's coercing us. I'm going to get on social media and yell at some strangers. Well, okay. That maybe that felt good. Maybe it didn't, who knows, right? Like that's maybe not the way this, we can't solve the problem though. If we're all just like pointing at Castor or Pollux and having a little battle, right? Cause then we just spin around in circles. But what I've been trying to talk to my clients and my students about handling these eclipses and these times is to, as much as possible, like we're going to be in the Gemini state, right? We can't get out of it, but as much as possible, pull in that awareness of like, there's another level to which we can approach and solve this problem. And that's like, when you get to the point where it's like, okay, I'm in Gemini world and we're having a battle, whatever, it could be the battle about the poisonous, whatever, or it could be the battle about you know, any, anything, um, to recognize like nine times out of 10, that person place or thing or media corporation or whatever is not the true, it's not your enemy, not really. Right. And I feel like, yeah, I feel like this year I just walk around being like, that's not the enemy. That's not the enemy. Um, certainly on the relative plane, we create inimical relationships with others, but when you create an inimical relationship, we did that energy vampire thing, right? You're now in a relationship. And if you agree to let someone be your enemy, you've agreed to give them a big portion of your energy. Um, and then, you know, which is, which is the challenge, right? Of Gemini, of Gemini North node time. 
have it we works just like the body thing because if you are holding on to the belief that like your enemy is out there always out to get you you're putting mental energy towards the enemy existing in your mind and in a way you're actually loving it oddly enough because it's, the word belief even comes from the word uh love leaf is an archaic word for for love or affection i think maybe not affection but definitely like love and respect so we it's not that you have to put your hands be like you know the three monkeys hands over your eyes and ears and if i don't believe in it it'll go away because that's incorrect as well it's more like just accepting uh every part of self and cosmos as being there for a reason there for growth even polarity like when we look at the time of year that we're in gemini is polarity but that's also how you generate charge what follows gemini season is like the most charged up uh, part of the year for the sun for the sol for the soul there's a lot of potential there and we need that type of uh, apparent dualism to get to the to the triality if you will there's always a mother father child in a sense there's not the polarity is never just stuck in in division forever it's like a mitosis situation no matter how hard it is to see it that way even in the in the time that we're in like even right now with who knows what's going to happen with all the people that did accept the poison dart it, it could be as crazy as like there's less people in the world uh very soon which is not fun to think about but i'm seeing that actually occur in my personal life and that's very very difficult energy as well but it's uh anything that we can let go of our hand is now open for receiving and that in definitely applies to to relationships we can let go of believing that somebody out there or something out there is our enemy as well and we might be able to see more clearly how we're our own saboteur instead of blaming it on the external so that's one way that opening up that space by letting go of the belief could bring something more useful to you like in in my opinion it's true. And, you know, there's also the positive side of Gemini. And, you know, collectively, we're all operating on this sort of, you know, you see a lot of bickering out in the world today. But if you think about the positive aspects of Gemini, it's the ability to nimbly see different factions of reality as pieces of reality. And so when you do that, it actually opens you up to compassion, right? Like what you just said. Um, you know, someone could make a different choice than you and experience an, an injury from it, right? Like someone could, something could happen to an individual and that elicits compassion, right? Like, oh, you're, you're different than me. You made a different choice than me, but um, you're my fellow human and you're hurting, right? That's compassion. Um, you could do that for any divide along any lines, right? But there's there's a way i always think about gemini as like you know that story of like all the people who are blindfolded and they're each touching a different part of the elephant right and one's like oh it's like a furry tail one's like no it's a long <laughs> rubbery thing and one thinks it's like the ear that's gemini right like that's the ability to be like oh i see a piece of this and it's a part of the truth and so to honor each person in their journey, right, is the hallmark of what a good use of this North Node would be to say like, okay, I see you. I recognize that we're making different choices and I'm okay with that. Um, it was funny when you were talking about giving your energy for, to the enemy, there's a, there's a story. I was in a workshop once with a man who was telling a lot of stories from the the Hindu pantheon and there's a there was a story he told about a demon so you know not the not the greatest character um just hating Krishna who is god right just hating hating him and he was like so inimical to Krishna that everywhere he went he just saw Krishna in everything and then he hated it so much that eventually he realized everything was Krishna. So everything was God. And then he realized a piece of him 
was related to Krishna. And then he became completely enveloped in the divine and like at one with the divine. So there's even, and you hear that all the time with people in their religions, they develop an inimical relationship to spirituality or to faith or to whatever, right? Like we, and then they give it a lot of their energy. And sometimes that actually gets us to a good place. So I, I also like to think about that because um, if, if someone is choosing to have an enemy in this life, if that's the way that the energies of the Gemini North Node have played out for some people and they've realized this is a battle I want to fight, this is something I do want to give my energy to, um, that can be okay too. But, but to do it consciously, right. To be like, okay, like choose in some ways, like choose your friends. And if, if you want to have, I mean, I sometimes think like there are things we have to engage with, there are battles we have to fight in this world, but do we have to have an enemy is, is a good question. I think. Yeah. It, at least I think it could be really simplified to just what's actually present with you right here now is it's almost like the difference between the definition of natural evil in the old sense of the word and what we call evil now, which is like um, sort of inverted behavior coming from people's imagination, a belief that things have to be a certain way. And if they're not, that it'll go wrong. So they do something evil as a uh, ends justify the means, but in ten, sense of natural evils in the uh, old meaning of the word it was like you know you might break your ankle while hiking or something mm -hmm. nobody caused that evil there was no enemy there but it's a type of an evil has befallen you and so in a practical like present moment sense there might be a, a situation or an individual that comes up that you have to put strong boundaries between you and that or protect somebody else from that right then and there. And so in that moment, it's like the enemy is there, but it's also a hurdle that becomes your path. It lets you, it lets, it gives you an opportunity to rise to the occasion as well. It's always like a test. And my point is, I think that nature allows like the left hand path or the right hand path, because at the end of the day, all roads go back to the same place, which is the Krishna or, you know, the, the divine, the the spark that is in all things and the the game that we're all playing here. I also think it's interesting the story of the North and South Node. Aren't they also called Rahu and Ketu? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in in Jyotish or Vedic. Do you know the do you know the mythological story of how they were created? The two headed dragon. Yeah. Can you do you know that well enough to kind of summarize it? I won't do it justice, but there are, there are many pieces of it, right? But essentially they're, they're like going in the separate way. It's like the, they're, so it's a little different in um, Western astrology when compared to Jyotish. So you're going to find a different interpretation if you go very deeply into Jyotish. I like to think of them both, right? Because, um, and I like Jyotish because it's very matter of fact. It's like, oh, this is bad. This is good. This is happening. This is whatever. And it, it does tend to view it more like a two-headed dragon, like something that could have detrimental, oops, I might need to plug my, my phone in. Um, I'm, gonna do, I'm not going to do it just if I try to tell the story because I will forget all the characters. Um, so don't don't ask me my mythology of the two hundred dragon. But are you still As there? I understand it, it was like this demon wanted to become immortal and it disguised itself as one of the gods and got into the party. That the gods were having this is my best summary someone told me the story in telegram right. and i was like this is so cool but which god was it <laughs> that's <sort> of, <laughs> that's why i'm like i don't yeah yeah so i'm not sure which god it was that was providing the ambrosia or the 
the drink that is supposed to give everlasting life. But the best summary I understood of this was that the demon thing that became the two headed dragon, it got a drink of the eternal life giving elixir. But then right as it was swallowing it, the God realized that it was had been fooled and chopped his head off. So its body became one node and its head became another node and they're both immortal, even though it's been severed, something like that. So that's why it's like seen as malefic in that system. But yeah, I just thought I'd test a little folklore <laughs> knowledge there because I don't have much knowledge of that. Those uh, Eastern stories, but they are usually pretty interesting. I have some sometimes, but I stick pretty, I stick pretty closely to the Shaivite tradition that I study in. So it's hard for me to accurately do justice to some of the other ones. <laughs> but yeah. I, yeah, they are the Rahu and Kitu, as far as they show up in your chart, um, they do, they can make you stuck. And they do feel like a dragon sometimes. Cause if you think about a place where you can become obsessed that's your south node. And if you think and about a place, it just drags on. You're stuck. Yeah. Dragon drags on. I don't know. You can totally get <laughs> stuck. Um, and your north node, you can totally get terrified by. It's terrifying to go somewhere new. Um, and so they, I think the Jyotish astrologers do a really good job of seeing that. And especially when you think about how. You know, because lots of people use their energy well and they live healthy, happy lives. Sometimes we deny pieces of ourselves and disease, energetic ailment, whatever can develop in the body or in the energetic state. Um, and you see these people getting depleted. You see things arising in their lives, um, sometimes externally, sometimes internally. And so it's important to know um, how those things can operate. It's also important not to scare people, right? Like, so if someone's listening to this and they're fine, don't think that you have a disease where your South node is. If you came to an astrologer and you preemptively had an ailment, they could help you see what that energetic patterning was, but that energetic patterning can show up different ways. So people can use them for the positive, which is what I try to interpret and encourage people to do because why would you want to go the wrong direction? But you also have to be wary and know that um, every day you have a choice and you can live well or live poorly. And so, um, you know, we, most of us have our good days and our bad days, but, if, but you want to live well, hopefully, um, and not just sit in your dragon's lair and feel it happen like that. Yeah, the, the dragons tend to accumulate quite a bit of junk. That's sort of their thing. They're laying on their own hoard, treasure hoard. Of and gold. what they do treasure is said to be like gold and gems and stuff. But that's not at this point. We've got a society that has replaced things with natural real world value with mostly stuff of imaginary conceptual value. Mm -hmm. So the accumulation for a lot of us that we sit on is more can be more mental more mercurial if you will i think about i think about the the system of of wealth that we subscribe to more often than you would suspect um i was um i've i mean i've always been interested in like what is what is material reality and why why do we value what we value and do the things we value actually have value? And, um, you know, what did the great spiritual teachers say about these things, right? Because we find so many spiritual teachers who basically are like, forget money. Even when money was gold, right? They were like, who cares? <laughs> um, and I actually read something. Have you read Autobiography of a Yogi ever? No, I haven't read that one. I've been recommended it. Well, there's a moment in that book. So it was published in the 1940s for like Christian America kind of 
like autobiography of this man who was a true yogi in, in India. And he, as a child, knew he wanted to be a yogi. And his eldest brother um, was sort of like, okay, you want to like go find God? That's great. But what about like you have to eat? You have to, you know, have money essentially. And, um, and this, this young man at like age 17 or 18, this man who wrote the book had said to his brother, um, you're mistaking where money comes from. He was basically like, don't think that your well being, your safety, your anything comes from some material around you or some person, place, or thing, because everything simply comes from this divine source. And his brother was basically like, prove it. I'm going to buy you and your friend a one way ticket to this town nearby. You have to go with zero money. You have to not skip any meals. And you have to go sightseeing because I guess it was a place you could sightsee. So they get on this train and um, these people come up to him and not only do, do all the things they need to have happen, happen, but they, they happen in the most profound ways. Like these men find them and they're like, oh, you're two young people. And we were supposed to be hosting like literal royalty today. Um, we have this huge feast, but they, they're not coming now. Do you want to come eat their food? So they go have like a feast. And then they run into a man who does like luxurious touring. And he comes up to them and he says, I've dreamed your face before. And I think you're supposed to teach me yoga. Can you teach me meditation? And I'd love to just take you around. And he like buys them a first class ticket home and all these things. So, um, which is such a remarkable story because it was very much like a, a brotherly, like, prove it <laughs> kind of situation. Um, but but I, there is something there, and I wonder this all the time. Um, where, where have we decided what matters to us? Like, and I think in this world right now where everybody's losing it, right, is there, is there a way to articulate what is actually of value to you? Like, where is your treasure essentially? Like, what treasure do you want your dragon to sit on? Is it, is it rooted in your soul, right? Or is it rooted in just like survival or um, fear or, you know, all these things? Um, it was kind of a long story, but. I love that story. I think it is really appropriate for the, sky clock energy we're in right now i didn't start the show with it but i did draw some cards to talk about in this episode we'll just maybe kick off part two with that something i've been doing daily since i had michael wan on the show a while back a couple of weeks ago and he gave me the idea of just pick my three different favorite decks and draw a card from each every morning and what has helped me to understand the the message being shown to me when I do that is to write it all out and interpret it as if there was someone sitting next to me that I wasn't reading it for. And uh, I didn't do that today because I got a late start, slept in, enjoying being in my own home, in my own bed for once. But I did decide like, hey, maybe I'll just do it on this episode and it'll apply to this conversation. And I think the topic that you just got into of being able to trust that the right thing is going to happen and that there is something more valuable than even what you thought you needed for survival and that what's true and what, what exists in reality will always be in existence and always be part of reality. And that includes that force, which sustains us and gives us life. It's always all around us and available. And it is our, perceptual filters that keep us from being able to access it or our our beliefs about ourselves like i couldn't i couldn't uh, expect someone to just take care of me that i've never met uh today even though i definitely need the help today there's a podcaster freeman fly who tells all the time his story of getting in a bus with no money and driving all the way across the country and having people there to help him exactly when he needed it <laughs> at every stage of the journey. 
And that's what going towards the North Node would feel like for anybody, regardless of where it was at on their chart, is like, well, if I step out towards the North Node, I'm basically going to have to walk off the edge of a cliff. And all my support, my South Node is all the way behind me, directly at my back. I'm moving away from it. So all that stuff I thought I needed for survival or for comfort, I'm leaving it behind if I step off this cliff towards the North. But what ends up happening is that's the point where you have decided to act courageously and the unseen forces will come to your aid and you can realize that yeah everything that you thought you needed and thought you needed to hold on to when you open your hand uh what i like to say about it is the the archetypes that we release or let go of within ourselves or in our external world in the form of care, people or situations that same archetype will be waiting for us further down the path in a different costume. And they will be empowered to help you to the degree that you've empowered yourself uh, on that journey towards it, wherever you've gone. So I'll cover how this all pertains in the, the cards on hour two. I think we have about five minutes right now in the first hour to kind of wrap up anything on the conversation that we've gotten into for free people before we move over. And also uh, would love it if you use that time to tell people how they can work with you directly, anything special you might be offering right now or anything coming up that is uh, worth mentioning to them. And thanks for being here as well, of course. Always fun to catch up with you. That was a really fast first hour. Yeah, it's so fun to talk to you. And I love what you just said. Like, that's totally the message of the fool and the world and the tarot, right? It's the journey through those spaces. And you even see the fool walking toward the cliff, but being totally protected. Um, so let's see, people can get in touch with me. So if you want to learn a little bit about astro yoga, I have a free ebook. If you sign up for my mailing list, it's astro yoga for your sun sign. Don't need to know anything, but you'll learn a little bit about how it works with the Zodiac. I do full astrology readings. Um, I have a teacher training that's actually on demand right now. So if you want to, if anybody is like, yes, that's me, I want to dive super deep, get in touch with me about that. And I also have, I'm so excited about this. I have memberships now. Um, so I started a monthly membership. There's two tiers. One is for people who want monthly personal astrology readings and like can text me their questions and I'll pull cards for them and stuff. Um, and the other has like a 50 page monthly booklet with your full horoscopes for your signs, um, new moon, full moon information, as well as like group ask me anything sessions and access to a huge online on demand astro yoga library. So if anybody wants to try that one, um, I'll send you a link to get it for like seven bucks for your first month. Usually it's $27, but it's, um, it's like a, it's a ton of stuff. And I love it. Cause I, um, I mean, you do this chance, right? You have your, your Patreon people and you get to like hang out with them and get to know them. And I've really enjoyed since I started the memberships in December, um, th doing this new format. Cause I get to, look at people's charts over and over when they come to the group sessions and have um, sort of more robust conversations than I get to have in sort of these quick exchanges and, and more personal for people's charts. That sounds awesome. I'm going to take you up on that. I hope everybody else considers it as well. I think we had one of my friends who is also a listener to the show recently got his uh, wife a reading with you as well and i heard that that went really excellent and that he, he was super stoked on it he's just like man i gotta learn more about astrology this is crazy it's way too accurate <laughs> it's a it it is amazing um i mean i first started learning it because i disbelieved it i had an inimical relationship there we go with astrology and it became an astrologer because of it because it was so uh wacky wacky accurate wacky accurate, accurate. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good word all right well we'll move over to the second hour i'm excited to reveal the cards that came up for this conversation and get your take on it and uh so i'm going to play our mid-show break 
Remember, everybody, patreon.com forward slash interverse is how you get our two or rockfin.com forward slash interverse. All that will be linked in the show description, however it is you're watching or listening to this. And I appreciate your time today, Emily. Looking forward to getting deeper and more esoteric in part two. Well, all right. How about that one, everybody? The great Emily Ridout returns. If you're a longtime fan of the show, that should be exciting for you. And if you're new to Emily, how could you not like her? She's got such a peaceful and like calm demeanor that is also very energized and elegant. Always enjoyed talking to her. And the second hour, this time around, we kicked it off with uh, talking about cards that came up for this particular conversation. So if you want to get into our interpretation of a few cards and also to see how those cards actually brought us back full circle to some of the things we were talking about at the beginning, but with new perspective and uh, sort of solutions oriented perspective about all the wild stuff going on in the world right now. I didn't ask her for a forecast about what's next on the sky clock, but what I hear is that the type of shifts and the energies we've been going through 2020 and 2021 are actually just kind of kicking off. And we're at the beginning of a large new cycle, a new normal as the, as Dr. Evil probably called it or whatever. So I'll probably be brief here in this outro, as you heard me maybe sort of complaining about, I did just get back from a long trip. I've got a lot of residue to sweep up metaphorically. A lot of things to get in order, but I do appreciate you guys tuning in for this conversation. I hope you liked it. I hope you support Emily and uh, check out emilyridout.com. She said she'd be providing me with a link to a discount for a month of her membership service that she does where you can get personalized astrology and yoga advice from her. I do support anyone doing that, especially with the huge discount she offered. So watch out for the link in the show notes in the description. I'll probably also post it to Telegram. If you're not in our Telegram group, also look for that in the show notes because we have a lot of great conversations there. It's been going on for several weeks now since I started it. It's kind of replaced Discord in terms of a community hub, but it's easier to use. People seem to like it. I love it. There's a lot of geniuses in there. So I'd like to hear from more of you guys listening and girls. And if you want to support the podcast, don't forget Rockfin and Patreon are the ways to do it. The second hour, always more interesting than just one hour alone. I'm going to play us out today with a track from somebody in our, as an esteemed individual in our audience of Interverse Tribe named Ben McDonald. He made this awesome song that you're about to hear. So check the show notes for all that. And I'm going to fizzle out early on the outro because I, need to get up from the computer and <laughs> work on what has been spoiled in my own life and take out the trash and all that good stuff. Thanks for being here though. And uh, look out for more coming up. There's a lot on the schedule and some heavy duty research episodes coming soon. And I appreciate you guys being here. Much love to everyone and bye-bye. Mm-hmm.